Hello, welcome to Ready for Mistakes. I'm Jeff Smoody, a photography-based artist from Illinois. This is a photography podcast where I talk to artists about their work and their ideas. Thank you for listening, and I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the first interview episode of 2024 for Ready for Mistakes podcast. Hope you guys got a good chance to listen to Megan Gould's interview that I did with her back in, uh, that was released back in December. Uh, really, really great conversation. Love talking to a fellow UMass Dartmouth MFA graduate. And I did get to go see her show up at the Griffin Museum that following day after that episode was recorded. Uh, it was a really great show, really wonderful work in there. And very excited to see uh, what more Megan has in store for us with all the crazy things that she does with different processes and photo adjacent things. If you guys got a good chance to listen to the 2024 goals episode, um, that one finally went out a little bit late as to what I expected to put it out, but I'm glad I did wait a little bit for that because ultimately it allowed me more time to think about how I wanted to approach that and also keep it as concise as possible. If you hadn't noticed, I have a tendency to ramble. Glad I got that one out of the way so I can continue on with the interviews. So today I'm going to be talking to Ben Ward, who's someone that I met out at the Chico Review this past March, and he's the second person from Chico Review that I am talking to on the show. Uh, The first one was Bailey Quinlan, and that was a really great conversation with her. So yeah, I got to see Ben Ward's work at Chico. I got his book, I Dream of Dust, out there. It was a really fantastic body of work. Um, and a very, very nice, relatively small size of a photo book as well. Really highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, But we spent a lot of time talking about that book and how he went about making it, as well as how it connects to other works of his, like Mud. A really great conversation about all that, so hope you guys enjoyed that part of it. Um, But of course, I need to give you guys a bit of a primer if you haven't heard of Ben Ward's work. I, of course, as usual, recommend you take a look at his website or Instagram just to see what his work is. Um, But here is a brief bio about him. Ben Ward is a Colorado-based American photographer and cinematographer. His work focuses on a documentary approach to the human experience and the changing social and environmental landscape of the American West. In 2021, he published his book, I Dream of Dust with Temper Books, and in 2018, he published Clay during the production of the short film Clay by Holocene Studios. He's been featured in Then There Was Us and 2022, in Boom, the one with seven O's, as mentioned on a previous episode, their publication Circles, uh, Pomegranate Press's uh, Nothing Left But Healing, And he's had solo shows that include Lonesome Valley Calls in Fort Collins, Colorado, Lonesome No More at Bolt Gallery in Fort Collins, and has been featured in Forms at Side Stories in Denver, Fragments of Devotion at Secret Flowers in Richmond, Virginia, Nothing But Left But Healing by Agony Books, also in Richmond, Virginia, and Image Nation Paris, uh, and Gallery Joseph Turin, and also, also in Paris. Uh, Those Frenchies are probably going to get mad at me for pronunciation, but here we are. I'm American. This is a great conversation. It's uh, a little bit less than an hour for this one. So anyway, let's get into this conversation that I had with Ben Ward. Hey, Ben, how's it going? Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's good. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, really exciting to uh, get to talk to you after uh, quite a few months since we were both at Chico. You're the second Chico uh, person to come on the show, which is quite fun. Um, So I'm really curious about, like every artist, um, how you got started in photography and how you got to where you are now with it. Sure, yeah. Um, I got started with photography, I mean, as a kid, like I... I would camp a lot with my parents. We would always do like little vacations every year, just kind of road trips with our little um, pop-up trailer behind us. And um, yeah, at some point, I think my parents would always, they would start giving us like a disposable camera every time we went on vacation. And that was just like always my highlight of it. And I I really latched onto that. And, and starting pretty early, um, my brother and I were pretty close. He's he's like a year and a half older than me. We were really into like skating and biking and that kind of thing. So at some point I just decided like I want to film this and I want to take photos. So I think that was really my my intro to 
photography and like video production too was wanting to capture the you know like the stunts we were doing and and from there I started to learn more about like camera settings and you know just never really looked back yeah, that's um I've found more and more that basically that scenario is really common with um a lot of the a lot of the men photographers is skateboarding BMX whatever or music um which I think is really fun um cuz that's kind of where I came from too is I was the videographer for my little skate crew in high school because I couldn't skate, so exactly. I was yeah I was given camera duty, um, which was a lot of fun. I first came across your work a little bit before Chico, when just kind of seeing you know who else is going along there, um, and of course at at Chico, seeing your book uh, "I Dream of Dust" was my first like physical encounter with your work, um, which is this really wonderful narrative portrait of Eastern Colorado. So I'm really especially interested in um, how that project um, got its beginning and how it how the process went. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the kind words, too. Um, that project started when, let's see, it was probably 2017 or so. I got a large format camera. Um, I just picked it up off of, you know, some guy on Craigslist was selling a bunch of camera gear out of his motel room, and uh, and I only wanted the large format, but he's like, you got to take it all. So I got a ton of gear <laughs> from that haul, which was great. And that was, uh, yeah, so I, I, I really just wanted a place where I could practice large format photography that was slow, and I could, you know, go somewhere in the middle of a field and just try something out and I don't, I wouldn't feel rushed. Like I wasn't taking portraits of anybody. I was just driving around. And I think the pace of Eastern Colorado really matched, um, you know, like learning large format photography for me. So they kind of went hand in hand really well. And, um, and I'd been spending a lot of time in Eastern Colorado for work stuff. I do, I do a lot of like video production for, um, Colorado state university and, you know, it's a, former ag school. So there's a lot of like agricultural roots and a lot of that is really just, you know, 15, 20 minutes east of where I live. So I was out there a lot and I just, it started to pique my interest a little bit. I was like, oh, there's some really cool stories out here. There's a lot of small towns. There's a lot of, um, you know, an interesting part of Colorado's history that kind of gets overlooked often. So I was really interested in it and, and getting that, the large format camera just, um, was a nice little nudge in that direction to go just drive around for, for days on end and, and see what happens. And so that's how it started. And, you know, the more, the more you go out and take photos and meet people, it kind of snowballs into something bigger and bigger. And that just kept happening. Yeah. That's always the, always the hope with things like that. Um, I wish I would break out my large format more often. It's uh, currently packed away. It's sad. <laughs> Actually, all my all my film gear is packed away right now. It's just too damn expensive. I know. Yeah. Now, un, unrelated to photography, but maybe conceptually related. Now, would you consider Eastern Colorado to be like spiritually part of the Midwest because of how damn flat it is? Hmm. I I don't know. I'm maybe a little bit Colorado. Yeah, a lot of people. I've heard people say that Colorado is the Midwest, and I always hate that because I, yeah, I think it yeah. is West, and I think it's more than just mm -hmm. like where it is on a map. I think it it has like the mindset of the West, and but yeah, Eastern yeah. Colorado, it, yeah, it's it's exactly where it starts to bleed together, and where the Midwest becomes the West. I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. It's it's, it's like a gray area. It's yeah, politically no, but you know, spiritually maybe. I think so. Yeah, there's something yeah. there. Um, so the structure of of the book um, follows, you know, landscapes, environmental portraits, and interiors, which, as we've seen in the past, like, 30, 40 years, even back to the, um, to the late 70s, has been a really effective structure for projects like this of driving around, collecting a pile of pictures, and putting it into this little tome of photographs. And it's really since it was the, the West before the Rockies, um, when you were shooting these photos, um, what really drew you to, or as you were shooting them, what drew you to taking a picture of a specific person or a specific location or place while you were out there? Yeah, I think a big reason that 
um, Eastern Colorado appealed to me. It was like, I think the theme that I wanted to explore with that book was um, like isolation and loneliness. And I think that's a lot of times like what I felt when I was out there, not in a bad way. It's like you're one, like physically you're very alone. Like there's just not a lot of people who live out there um, compared to the front range where I live. I think in my mind, you know, we've all seen a lot of work that feels like Western. It's like this very like romanticized Western cowboy um, artwork. And, and I'm no stranger to that. I think growing up, I, I saw a lot of that. My parents are really big Western art fans. And, and I've always really loved that and appreciated that. And, and I think I started to realize like how that is like a very romanticized thing. And it's, it's kind of this like false idea of what the West is. And it's, it's a much more complicated place than, you know, the, the open range and like the lone ranger yeah. kind of thing. Um, so I wanted to explore that a little bit. And, and I think there's just like a complicated history of that area that I was really interested in exploring. Um, yeah. And a lot of the people out there, I really appreciated talking to them and, um, being allowed to, to get into their world a little bit and photograph them. Yeah. It's like, um, I'm really interested in like how, how that landscape that you were in compares to, um, like the area of Illinois that I take a lot of photographs in when I'm there. Cause you know, I saw like certain similarities between the places that you were taking pictures of and the places that I lean toward as well. And, you know, it makes me wonder when you're out outside of Colorado, um, let's say, for example, you go to New York or Michigan or wherever, have you ever come across areas or places that make you think like you're, you've somehow been mentally transplanted back to Colorado? Because that's something that I've experienced out here where like, I drive past a certain landscape in Massachusetts and I like my brain for a second trips and thinks I'm in Illinois for some reason. Has that ever happened to you? There's certain spots in the West for sure that have similarities. Um, but I don't know. I honestly, it, I really struggle to like come up with a place that reminds me of Eastern Colorado. Obviously mm -hmm. there's like Nebraska, there's parts of Nebraska you might drive through or Kansas that feel really similar, but I do feel like it has a very distinct flavor in, in Eastern mm -hmm. Colorado and the landscape I think is, is, I can't think of many that are, are similar. Yeah. Other than like flat plains, you know, which it kind of makes me wonder. It's a I, I've been asking a variation of this question to pretty much everybody um, on the show is for your Colorado based photography and your you know familiarity with it for artists that are based in Colorado or the mountain time zone or just, you know, that kind of pocket of the U.S., do you feel like there is some kind of visual accent to the photographers that work there? Um, like certain tropes, certain styling, certain thematic interests that are more commonly done by artists that are in Colorado or that area of the country. I think a lot of people go to the mountains to photograph for sure. And I, mm -hmm. I think for me, like I've, I've lived here my whole life and I can pretty easily pick out like those are Colorado Rocky mountains. Yeah. Um, so I see that often. Um, I think the thing that is very unique to this region is like really harsh light. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people come here and like struggle to shoot in the light because it is, it, we're so much higher and it's very dry. So you don't have that level of humidity that you might, you know, if you're photographing in on the coast or like yeah. in a very humid, low elevation region, like the light is a bit harder to, to handle here. But you see a lot of people embracing that. Like I think Robert Adams has talked about that yeah. very distinctly before and he, how he loved it. Like it mm -hmm. really matches like the feeling of being in a hot, dry place where you have these highlights that are all like kind of blown out and hard to control. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I see a lot of people trying to like capture that, that feeling that you might get from that. I think the first time I came across that kind of sensation and didn't really know what to do with it was the first time I had a road trip out to Colorado and Wyoming in 2018. Uh, what I did notice was that, especially when driving through, like before we got to Grand Teton National Park, we were driving through some of the hills in Montana, Montana, Wyoming, that it really, this was like noon and it just felt just bizarrely bright, like you're describing. And, you know, it was like, 
I feel like I could take photographs of this, but I just have no idea how to approach it because I'm just not as familiar with being in that landscape. So it would make sense that the people that uh, like yourself that are much more tuned into to dealing with that, that are able to make work in that area, about that area in a much more effective way than an outsider coming in on vacation. Yeah, I, I recently, I don't know if you're familiar with Tim Richmond at all. He was originally from the UK, but he lives in Montrose now, which is on the western slope of the Rockies. Yep. And I recently did like a darkroom print workshop with him. Um, just drove out there and kind of hung out with him for a few days. And we were printing a lot of my work from Colorado and, and Wyoming, this kind of region. And I, I have a tendency to kind of underexpose things and really like dial things back and like drop it down and make it kind of feel dark and, you know, I guess cinematic. Like that's kind of... Yeah. My background is like, let's bring stuff, like underexpose it a little bit. But he had a kind of a different viewpoint where he talked about like when you're in the dark room, especially, and you're like trying to, you're not necessarily trying to print something like the most beautiful, like a color grade, like you would do in, in like film. Um, he's like, what does it feel like? Like, what did it feel like when you took this picture? And like, how do we kind of recreate that feeling? And that's like, okay, well, a lot of these, it was summer and it was like hot and dry and like very arid. And so we like tried printing some of the photos in that manner. And it's like, it gives you a whole different feeling. It kind of matches the vibe of like what you were feeling when you took those photos. And that was an approach that I'd never really thought of before. Yeah, I think that's um, really present in a lot of the photos, like flipping through and on your website and such. Like there are certain photos that have like a really narrow range of tones that's just like very close grayscale um grayscale tonality and then other ones that are much more punchy with their contrast and um i think that the way that you approached those those kind of photographs uh helped with playing with that painting that picture of the of the landscape making making it feel you know hot and dry and all that even like the i'm looking at the one of the the ice fisherman with his dog. Um, that's like a, one of the more lower contrast ones. Even though it's in the winter, it still kind of feels like it's an arid, dry time of the year. Oxymoronic from what it actually is. And I think that the the way that that kind of works throughout the series and sequence really, really helps with that. And I'm thinking about your, your other works, um, Mud and DIY, that are fully color. And then you're uh, other work, uh, migration. That's a combination of the two. So, with what you just said about the process with the darkroom and all that, how did that? How do working on those projects versus working on I Dream of Dust is strictly black and white? How did that decision come about? I honestly, it was. It kind of went hand in hand with getting that large format camera and, and learning a mm -hmm. new camera. It just made sense to at least start just shooting black and white because I was going to make mistakes, and it's just a lot easier to learn. And I think from there, you know, I shot a lot when I was in Eastern Colorado. Um, I shot a lot of color, but I think it just wasn't resonating with me as much. And maybe that's just kind of where I was as a photographer at the time. But I think the black and white just resonated a little more and, and seemed to match the, the landscape and the themes that I was going after, too. And a lot of that, most of it probably was home developed. You know, I've, I've always um, developed my own black and white, and I'd... I don't really touch color. Like I don't like to yeah. develop my own color because I've messed it up so many times. So I think it was partially just practically it made a lot of sense. It saved a lot of money. And I think it, it just seemed to fit right with the subject matter. Yeah, I think that like with with the content of uh, of this work, you know, black and white really just makes so much sense for it. And come and I mean we'll talk about your other your other works soon, but like those ones really make a lot of sense in color. And this one, I feel like it being strictly black and white. Like, obviously, we don't have the photos in color, so we wouldn't know what it would be like if it were color. But I feel like just based on, you know, everything from the title to how the book is made and um, to the paper choices and all that, all the physical tactile things, just the black and white just really grasps onto all those things about the loneliness and the um, isolation that is felt in a lot of these images. Um, so I'm also curious, uh, you kind of, we kind of touched on it a little bit before, but I'm really curious about how the making, like the finishing of this book uh, affected your relationship to Colorado and the American American West as a whole. 
Yeah, I think the the whole process of making the book just it it didn't necessarily it's not I learned a lot from it, but I think it reinformed a lot of thoughts that I had before that I'm just kind of fascinated by Eastern Colorado and that whole mm-hmm. area and and it's again it's kind of hard calling that the same as the West because I think there are two different things. But um, yeah, yeah, it was just a commitment. Like it was a I think I shot for two years for that, and then it t- maybe took like a half year, maybe a full year to make the book. So it was a, it was a long term commitment, and I think I still have people from that book that I photographed and spent time with mm-hmm. that I that I'm able to keep in contact with, and you know, I've I've gone out for other shoots like I've shot some like music video, like documentary projects out there and like kind of utilize some of the people that I met. So it helps that it's, it's an ongoing relationship. And, and also like so many of those photos from that book, um, there's a lot that are way out there that I, you know, did weekend trips for and drove hours for, but a lot of that is, you know, 15, 20 minutes away from where I live now. So it really is this kind of blurred line of, it is kind of where I live, but it's also very different, you know? And I think that was part of the initial fascin- fascination. Um, I don't know if you know the the highway structure of Colorado, but there's I-25 runs north-south kind of bifurcating the state. Yeah. Um, and to me, I was just like fascinated by how that is this dividing line between the front range on the left, on the west, where you have Denver and Boulder and Fort Collins, and it's like, very much one way politically and like, you know, there's cities, it's not rural at all. And then you can drive literally 10 minutes east of I-25 and it's just a completely different world. Yeah. So I think that was very much part of my initial, initial fascination is like, this is kind of right in my backyard and it feels like this land that I can just explore and like get lost in. Yeah, that's something that I've been fascinated with. I think that's one of the reasons why I uh, really got drawn into into this book. Um, and it's like I've I've I have a few other books on my shelf that are artists that have made stuff in say you know the the Southwest or in the mountains and all that. And then you know look at other work that they made like since making that work. Like an obvious example for me is is like Kyle McDougall's uh, American Mile, all in the Southwest and everything. But then looking at his newer work where he's exploring um, the UK, he's kind of managed to find certain similarities between those two places. But um, it's just like, it's interesting seeing how he's, how artists will like be by something that is very heavily like associated with the state or the region or whatever. But then there's this kind of offset that of other things that is really interesting. Uh, honestly, sometimes more interesting. Like these days, that's what I've been doing is like, yeah, I'm at the coast. I'm in Massachusetts. I could go to the Cape. I could go to Boston, whatever, take photos there. But I have found myself much more interested in trying to find open farm fields, something that's really not associated with Massachusetts in a lot of ways and finding those things in like an equivalent to what you've been, what you've been finding out there. So now kind of backtracking to the, the physical book itself, you know, it's a, the book is like really not that big. It's a, what, it's like an 8 by 10 something like that? Yep. Yeah, it's 8 by 10 And it's, you know, I didn't even realize it only has like 57, I think was the number of images in the book, which it feels like there's more than that, which I think is really cool that it's, you know, a pretty, pretty, pretty much in that like comfortable range for a lot of photo books in number of images. But like, I really don't get tired of looking through it and it, it flows really well together. So I'm really curious about the editing and design process to make the book. Yeah, well, I definitely have to mention that a lot of the editing and design came from Temper. Um, Jesse L. Gonzalez was was the one helping out with a lot of that. And then we had a, a graphic designer from, um, his name's Callan, and he, he did a lot of like the actual design and typography. But yeah, I think for me going into it, I wanted to keep everything simple. Like that was my North Star for the whole book is like, I just, yeah. I just want it to be simple. I don't want a lot of text. I don't want frills. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be this like long, um, dragged out project. Like I just want it to feel simple. That's, that's something I like, you know, not that the book has that many similarities to a zine, but I do like how zines, you know, they're, it doesn't feel like you're getting into something when you, you can just pick it up and leaf through it. Um, and you don't have to, spend hours with it you know it's yeah. just it's just something that you can get into if you want and it's simple and it's hopefully approachable 
Yeah, that's. Um, I think that really does come across because I'm thinking about some of the other physically larger books that I have. Um, like the largest one I have by like the face dimensions is um, Katie Grannon's The Nine and Ninety Nine books, which okay. are huge. And then the second biggest by like half a centimeter is um, Stephen Shore's uh, Selected Works. And Katie Grannon's, despite having that huge surface area of the front. Um, is similar in that it's it's not very big. It's easy to flip through that, and I think that's how it found that balance. Um, but then there's, you know, Stephen Shore's books really are kind of like a whole, like, six-hour movie epic situation, and it's like sometimes that's really hard to get through. Um, so that's why I think that your, your book really found that, all of y'all found a really good balance of those things that I think really made it that successful. Um, and right on the cover of the book, we have... Um, one of the uh, recurring characters of the people that you photographed. So I'm curious about who those recurring characters in the book are. You kind of you kind of mentioned them a little bit before, um, who they are and how they influenced this project. Yeah. So there's there's a few subjects in the book that get shown um, more than once. There's I can't, there's not too many of them. But yeah, there were a few people that I just met that, you know, whether it was multiple occasions um, or I just spent a whole day with them or whatever that, um, and I just felt, you know, I I have no issue with putting somebody in a book twice or like having them on the cover and then in the book. Um, I think if it adds to it, that's fine. I feel like there's some books that really thrive off of this feeling of, um, like surprise and like randomness where like every page you turn, it's like, this is a different person miles away and you're surprised like every time you turn the page and that's really cool. But I didn't really feel like I needed to inject that into this book. It's like, it's okay if you're spending a bit more time with people or like in one region, I think I was okay with that. Yeah. I think that also starts to contribute to that, that narrative of the place where by having just a couple recurring people throughout the book helps us us as the viewer relating to it, despite not knowing these people, not having their names, um, just by them recurring a few times um, helps us with, you know, almost becoming personally attached to them. Um, and one thing that, uh, that I noticed uh, with this book is that, to, at least to my knowledge, uh, all of the portraits are of men in this, and they all kind of fit a very particular kind of character that I feel a lot of people associate with that style of landscape, the flat open country area. Um, and I'm curious about what your thoughts are on the, on this aspect of the book that all of the portraits are of this particular demographic and I dare say stereotype of sort of men in the project. For sure. Yeah, there is, there's one woman in the book, but it's kind of like a wider shot and it's, it's really hard to see. So, um, but yeah, I mean that was that was very intentional. I think one of the the other themes that I tried to explore with this work, and at the time was just I was thinking a lot about masculinity and how this like traditional Western understanding of masculinity is uh, has like had an effect on my life and others' lives, and just something that I kind of wanted to explore with that. And um, it, I think with this book, I really hoped to ride the line of like almost playing with cliche mm-hmm. and you know because there's a lot of there's dudes wearing cowboy hats and yeah, there's exactly. old rusty cars and like we were talking about I should have mentioned that but those are kind of photo cliches for the oh West, exactly obviously yeah. you know but I like the idea of playing with that and in a way that kind of I think helps draw people in I think um, you know if you're somebody who doesn't follow my work or might not super be into like contemporary photography, but you see a book, it's like, Oh, this is like a book about the West and I like cowboys and I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. It might be something that draws those type of people in, but hopefully it does enough to subvert that too, where it's, it's not these super romanticized, like gorgeous pictures of like heroic cowboys. It is (laughs) exactly, it is more of these like tender, quiet moments where it plays with, um, you know, this idea of masculinity that also like comes with isolation and loneliness maybe. I think that, um, you know, it, it helps with that too. Um, you know, we have like certain things that they really is this kind of part of their lifestyle is that 
not only did they probably grow up with that stereotype of being in the West, like, oh, if you're in the West in the country, you're probably going to dress in uh, work boots and jeans and a cowboy hat, right? So, And they probably had the ex- that exact kind of upbringing that everybody else outside of that probably had. And what's also kind of interesting to me is that it feels like seeing these people in like these in these scenes, it feels so much more honest and real to who they are as people and to the landscape they're in. I I I went to a concert recently um, where a Colorado-based artist uh, Gregory Allen Isikoff was performing mm-hmm. out here. Um, love his music. I was there for the openers, though, Mill Carton Kids. Okay. I love Gregory. Nice. But I yeah. love the Mill Carton Kids more. So as it goes. But what was really funny is, like, this is in Boston, and I'm looking at the crowd, and there's not a whole lot of transplants in Boston. There's very few uh, people from outside of New England. And... Seeing people wearing wide brim hats, cowboy hats, whatever, um, is just so funny because I'm like, I don't know if this person moved here from Nebraska or if they have lived on the East Coast their whole life and just really got into folk music yeah, <laughs> and just attached that to their lifestyle. There's no way to know. And of course, it's not right to assume that, but it is kind of funny seeing that in, in Boston of all places. Um, to the to the point of like the that kind of, you know, quiet, even melancholic feeling. Um, it's like you said before, it's really not like a negative thing about it. And it's really, it's lush yet somber kind of thing. And, you know, of course the expressions of them, like if you were to take away all the, all the garb of the West off of these guys, um, you know, you, you could see just in their expressions that there's, you know, they're in this kind of community, this, um, this landscape, I feel like that uh, the American West, especially, you know, r- right up before the Rockies, like we're in, um, that there it has that feeling of isolation, that melancholic aspect to it that isn't really negative. Um, would you and you've kind of said that you feel that that's pretty, pretty true to how you experienced it when you were photographing these people? You know, what was their um, what was it like working with them in the moment for the people that you spent, you know, a full day with to the people that came back to to the person you saw for 20 minutes and went on your way? I think a lot of people were surprised that I would want to take a photograph of them. I, you know, I got that a lot. Like, me? Like, are you sure? Like, of me? It's like, yeah, of course. And I, I think once I explained the project and, you know, kind of made it clear that it's like, I'm, I'm pretty fascinated with Eastern Colorado and I love this place and it's really important to me. I think that resonated with a lot of people. And, mm-hmm. and there's an understanding that that area and like rural areas and and rural communities are kind of maybe misrepresented in the media and they don't maybe like the way that they're represented. And so I think when they see that somebody is genuinely trying to make some sort of fair documentation about it, they really appreciate that. So I think, you know, of course there were people that just didn't want to be a part of it at all, but there were a lot of people that were like, Oh, this is, cool and you know i'm happy to share a bit of my life and you know let you photograph yeah something that i've i found too and i when i was a journalist taking photos of various rural areas um that was something that i came across a lot where you know even if i was asked to go to you know a farm to photograph a few people you know working or like maybe teaching uh high school students how to work on this specific thing um, there were some of the some of the older folks, you know, that I would want to try to get a like an action shot of would just have zero interest in. But then others were like all for it and understood like, you know, this is a this is a news story in this case about something very real to, you know, agriculture or to the community and all that. Um, so I think that that's going to happen with with a lot of rural folks. But I feel like what I found is that a lot more people say yes than they do say no. Yeah, I agree. You know, and and I've probably gotten better at figuring out the right questions and the right way to approach people. But, you know, I, I was, when I started doing this style of work, I was just terrified to ask people, you know, I'm just, yeah. I'm not, I'm an introverted person. I'm, I'm not one to just like go up to somebody and strike up conversation or ask them for something. Yeah. Um, but the more and more I started doing it, I was very surprised that people would say yes and 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 like have a much longer conversation and want to show me like, hey, like you want to see this? old car that I have or you want to see this thing it's like yeah that's great it's always a good thing to have that as I was looking through some of more some of your more recent work your your work mud which is a color 
uh, color series um, has some very, I feel like, pretty distinct expansions on some of the um, ideas that, um, that we can see in I Dream of Dust. Um, and the way that you wrote about it briefly on your website is that you're uh, quoting, searching for meaning in a vast expanse of nothingness. And yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> so I'm curious about how the color aspect of this work, um, and also thematically, how um, the MUD project um, relates to that of I Dream of Dust. Yeah, I think there's a lot of themes that with the new work I'm just continuing to explore. You know, a lot of that loneliness. I think that's always just been this like per- pervasive theme mm-hmm. in in the work. And it kind of just like informs what I think is a good scene. You know, if I see like one little car that's like in a completely empty parking lot, like that's something that I'm just attracted to and probably yeah. always will be. Um, so I think a lot of very similar scenes, but just um, regionally expanding way out to the west instead of just focusing on eastern Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, so that work, it's just ongoing, and it probably will yeah. be for, for years. Yeah, I think I've always really liked the idea in regards to the black and white and, and color question. I've really liked the idea of black and white projects, for me, seem to really work well when you're really focused in on like a specific region or like a smaller micro area or like time frame or whatever. And for me, when I want to approach something like a big, long project on like a really big region, color just kind of makes more sense. I don't know why, but yeah. Yeah. Like I always, I always think of Joel Sternfeld, like he's one of my favorites and his work is so grand and sweeping across the whole country um, and like wide frames. And I, feel like his work just would not work in black and white, you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess a lot of that informs what scenes, you know, I I pull over for too. It's like, if there's good color, that becomes a part of it versus for I Dream of Dust, you know, it wouldn't matter. Like I wouldn't pull over because there's like a bright red car, (laughs) whatever, you know? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Now, Grant, I have I have been playing around with uh, color filters in Photoshop since I do all digital these days, and you know I found personally a I really love the blue filter for black and white these days, which is just makes those reds just like re- like uh, any of those warm colors just really deep. But then also the inverse of like taking photographs of something like really bright red with a red filter, and just it's like I found that that's something interesting to work with um, in regard to like approaching a color scene, a very colorful scene with black and white. Yeah, what's uh, what I find really interesting about what I you know what I can see about um, mud on your website so far is that it's like it's hard to even pinpoint a specific area of the country, which I think is actually kind of to your point of that it's expanding on that. But what I do see is a particular motif going on, which is that of uh, the eagle in a handful of these photographs, which I think is really, really cool. And of course, it's a common, the probably the most common American symbol in regard to animals. And um, is that something that you sought out, or was that something that you more found latently while you've been working on it? I think that, and a lot of times when motifs like come up in in the work, it's something where it starts as a coincidence where I'm like kind of going through an edit of photos from early on and it's like oh I noticed there's you know two photos of a bird or like an eagle or something mm-hmm. so it's like okay that maybe this is something I should start looking for and seeking out and it might you know emerge more but yeah I mean I don't I wouldn't say that I seek that out from the beginning I think mm-hmm. I usually yeah. try to keep cast a very wide net at the beginning and see what comes up from it yeah I think that it um for me, like with um with that like realization later on is that um you know you see these photographs of this American landscape in the West and all that you then see this American symbol in there and it starts to do something really interesting to how like the feel of the images with the that well you know I'd say pretty um sometimes subtle sometimes a little more um more distinct use of that symbol um what that does to, to the project overall. Um, I think it makes it that much more effective to have a balance of like in your face to much more subtle, um, as you work through it. And like the whole project, like you said, like it speaks to a kind of loneliness that is really specific to this area of the country. And I think that's ob- one of the more obvious threads that connects it to a dream of dust. Were these projects made in succession? Were they kind of like blending together or were they more far apart in regard to when you started shooting? 
I think they're they're actually pretty far apart. I there might be some some bleed over from old photos that I've selected for it that I shot while shooting I Dream of Dust, but I think it was very much like after I finished that book, kind of gave it some time and then mm-hmm. um you know, was was traveling a decent amount and doing a, a lot of road trips and started to like think about this project coming together as like a cohesive body of work. So, yeah. I think they're they're fairly separate, but at this point, you know, this one's an ongoing one and I'll have other projects that are on my mind and I don't I can't keep things that separate because when you're the nature of a four or five year photo project, like I need to have other things going on, you know, I can't yeah, exactly. just focus on one thing at a time. Uh, what I've always found, um, especially when talking with my old photo professors to visiting artists, whatever, is that you know, there always needs to be some some amount of focus on, you know, when you figure something out, like, focus on that thing. But um, at the same time, like, you're not just so, like, so hyper-focused that that's the only thing you're ever working on at any given moment because that starts to become a little bit too intense. Um, little room to really expand on those ideas with experimentation and other things, so... I have yet to pick it up again, but I started doing these uh, light painting photos on the dunes on Cape Cod... And it's just this kind of like random, like one week thing I did while working on my thesis. I came back to it later. And then it's like those kind of little things while I'm hyper focused on one thing, those little offshoots can lead to a future project, which it sounds like whether or not you knew it, um, it sounds like that's kind of what happened with, um, with mud later on is that those few pictures before led to mud later on without you really realizing it. So I'm really curious about um, how how you think of the the landscape that you work in, um, and you know I'm always fascinated in you know novels or whatever that the landscape itself becomes kind of its own character. So I'm curious about your relationship to the landscape you photograph in and how that plays a role in your work. Yeah, I've always been interested in this idea of the landscape shaping the people that live there. And then mm-hmm. vice versa, the people shaping the landscape that they live in. And that's something that, yeah, I think really draws me into a scene where I see like this maybe beautiful vista or something. Like I'm not much of a landscape photographer in, in that traditional sense, but when yeah. there's some sort of like human touch point in it or like some, like a marking in a rock or some sort of like, something showing that a human has been here or like made its mark in that landscape. Like that really interests me. And yeah, that, that was something I thought a lot about with I dream of dust too, is there's, there's like a photograph of a man who lost part of his finger. Mm -hmm. And this idea that like, sure you, you work the land and you like make your mark on the land, but like also the, the land can kind of bite back at you too and make its mark on you. So I, I really like that human interaction with the land and, and that's always something that I look for in photographs. That's some, I think that um, the more rural communities and um, just country landscapes like that, um, the people that live there, I feel like, have a really more potent relationship to the land than um, people in you know urban areas. But that's of course you know a really broad stroke thing to say. But um, at least in my experience and through a lot of the artwork that I see about rural communities and rural landscapes is that really does come through is that um, you can see how both the land shapes them and they shape the land. It's really, really fascinating and something that I've always been interested in. And you, you've kind of talked before about how you work on these projects, that it's kind of like casting a wide net and then kind of figuring things out from there. Um, how has that kind of affected like from your older work to more recent work has that kind of remained the same the whole time? Or have you kind of started to figure out like more like where you're going to cast that net and how wide it's going to be? If anything, I try to keep things a little looser now. Even with I Dream of Dust, like I, I very, it started as, a, as an excuse to kind of get to know the camera and, and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. But at the same time, there was a point early on where it's like, okay, this is going to be, you know, maybe a book or this is yeah. going to be a project. And I want it to be the eastern half of Colorado. And I think I divined that like pretty early on. Whereas now I just have more projects going on now that I try to not define too much. Like I don't mm-hmm. 
want to give them a timeline and I don't want to like prescribe these parameters to them. Um, and I think I'll get to a point eventually where I want to do that, but I just don't feel like I'm in a rush to, to turn anything out right now. And I don't think I need to put those parameters on them yet. Now, um, of course I'm always interested in, um, like, uh, what, uh, kinds of, you know, artwork, like really broadly speaking from like music to literature to other artists, uh, visual artists, um, that you use as a way to kind of tease out certain ideas while you're working on things, you know, the kind of inspirational aspects. Is there any, anyone or anything specifically that helps you with, uh, with that process? Yeah. I mean, definitely. I, I don't read as much as I want to, but I read a decent amount. I've been reading a lot of Cormac McCarthy lately and there's, there's just books that it's like, this is the type of, you know, if I can make photography that feels like a Cormac McCarthy novel, then and I don't know how to describe that. I don't know how to. Yeah, exactly. What that it's means. honestly hard to describe. But that's what I want to do, you know. So I think there, I do consume art that very intentionally feeds this thing inside me, whether or not I know how to describe it. Um, and there's music like that too. You know, it's not like I'm always just listening to music that feels like the photography that I want to take. But yeah, there are like albums that I, for one, for example. Um, the work that I'm doing with Mud, to me, I want it to feel like Lonesome Crowded West by Modest Mouse. Yeah, yeah. Like, I love Modest Mouse, it, one of my favorite bands, and that album to me just feels so Western and obviously like Lonesome Crowded West. It just, it's in the name, you know? Yeah. And I think it's hard for me to like write down what I want a project to be and like write an artist statement, but. To me, if I can think of like, oh, I want it to look how this album sounds, you know, that's <laughs> that gives me a good kind of north star, I guess. I've uh, I've toyed around with exactly that thought of like, if I had to assign an album or an artist or whatever to a project or something like that of mine, that um, what you know, what would that be? And you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to figure that out. Like, yeah, uh, my project Dune Edge Face West may be named after a lyric from Law Dispute it doesn't look like how law dispute sounds. It's, it's sure. not, it's not yelling about depression. It's a, uh, it's a landscape of Northern Michigan. It's very different. Um, but I think that's really like a fun exercise to, you know, think about that. And it's like, if I had to assign a musician to my work, like I would probably choose the milk carton kids, not just cause they're my most listened to artist of all time, but also because I feel like a lot of what they write about, seems to apply to a lot of the things that I'm interested in making artwork about. So when you're kind of reaching a point of a project where you're starting to feel that sense of direction, you're starting to really um, like tease out what this project may be about, um, is do you feel like there's a shift in the process when you're, when you're shooting? Do you tend to shoot less and spend more time in the studio? Or is it still just kind of the same amount of shooting, but just more, more overthinking in the studio outside of that? Yeah, well, I'm a big overthinker, and that's part of why I was saying like I'm trying to still cast a wide net and just not yeah. think about it too much. Is because I know that I have the tendency tendency to overthink things and and dwell on things too much. So I am really trying to just like shoot whenever I have the inspiration to, and not think too much about it. And then, you know, in theory, it would be really cool to just shoot for a year straight and then look at the photos at the end of the year. But yeah, I'm just yeah. not, you know, I'll look at them for days on end when I get scans back. And um, yeah, so I, honestly, I'm like always still figuring out that part of the process. But yeah, these days I, I just like to shoot as much as I can and, and try to not think about it too much. You know, I'll, I'll, I've been trying to do more writing. Like when I'm out shooting, mm -hmm. I'll try to like write a little bit more about that. So at some point I can kind of revisit some of those entries and you know, that might help inform like how it all comes together. Maybe someone had said something about a lot of, a lot of photographers would be so much, so much better at what they would do if they would just write more. Um, and I'm dramatically paraphrasing that, but that's just kind of how I interpret it is like, you know, um, when a, when a photographer is also writing, regardless of if it's about photography, just writing in general, it kind of does something to the to the thought process about the work, um, and I tried that for a little bit with um, with my MFA thesis, and it kind of was around the time where I like finally hit the nail on the head. It's like once I started writing about whatever ideas I had, it was like suddenly things started to click. 
I think that's a really, really effective process for a lot of people, but though not everyone has that like writer's mindset. So of course it's not like a universal thing. Yeah. It's something that I have been trying to do more and I think will be beneficial to the the projects I'm working on now. Mm -hmm. But you know, for I Dream of Dust, like I didn't do much writing at all. I would make little voice memos in my phone Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing, you know, after meeting with people or just things that I wanted to remember, but that book very much you know there's not a lot of writing in it and I wanted it to kind of just like feel simple and like yeah not too overthought so I don't think it would have worked for that like if I was doing all this Mm -hmm. writing and like trying to like think about it all the time it might have kind of messed something up I don't know yeah it really is kind of like a like a case-by-case basis as to like when when are you writing compulsively about things like uh you know bringing it back to Vanessa Winship where like um, with uh, she dances on Jackson. I absolutely loved seeing the um, the written parts and hearing the written parts at Chico about um, about that project. And it's just so fascinating seeing how the writing works for a project like that. Um, and then later into um, into Snow. But then you get other work. Um, you know that's just writing could even distract from things that even like writing while working on it can distract from the, the spirit of the work from like intent of the work. Um, especially there's an amount of research that goes in, but this is, that's just getting so into the nitty gritty of process and practice and all that, which is its own, its own animal. So kind of shifting quite a bit to a different part of your artistic life. Um, you're, you have a video background and you briefly mentioned about doing video work for Colorado state. And I'm, Curious if you've ever done um, video work for fine art purposes, things like moving photos or, a, you know, a narrative video sequence or something like that. I honestly, like, I haven't done much, like, motion work for, you know, like, an exhibition or anything, like, mm-hmm. in that fine art space. Um, I've done a few. Like, I did a... I worked with a few friends of mine who also do, like, video production. Um, we got a grant a couple years ago to, like, produce a piece that ended up being projected downtown Denver and it was like part of this um this like nighttime exhibition thing that happens Mm -hmm. every year that was happening every year so that kind of thing but it's it's so different like I just don't align that too much with like the photo work that I do like it's very much a different headspace and it's more like collaborative process and it's a lot of that is more like based on just aesthetics and less about like trying to tell a story or like communicate much of a feeling, I guess. I mean, it has its similarities, but it's also for me, it's like different side of the brain almost. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, man, um, I tried doing some video work during my MFA time and like really early on, like trying to approach like moving photographs kind of thing. And I had this cool idea. It was like this two-sided video thing had animated handwriting back when I had an iPad. I was able to just record the handwriting on a like a screen recording. And um, it was really cool, but at the same time, it it just like did not really do what I wanted it to. It's like video is freaking challenging for that side of video. To yeah. like really express a an idea like that that has nothing to do with like a production storyboard situation like that. It's very unforgiving. Yeah. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that everybody just watches video all the time. Like everybody mm-hmm. knows what a good movie is. Yeah. Like every single person knows how to judge a movie. Yeah. So it's so unforgiving, you know, the second you make like a technical error or like you, you know, your exposure is messed up or your like audio blips, like everybody knows yeah. that's a mistake. Versus, yeah. you know, photography, you can kind of make mistakes and it's a little more forgiving because it's easier to, you know, things can be more abstract and like loose. I don't know. It's, it's very different. You can make a grave error in a photograph and it will still like hold some kind of conceptual value perhaps. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like one of my favorite photos in my MFA was completely on accident. I was trying to take a different photo through my windshield uh, of some of the mountains in Arizona and my camera, my I had a macro lens on my camera, so it wanted to focus close. So it focused on the windshield instead, and just it wound up giving me one of my favorite photographs that I've made. And it's like, all right, cool, that's fine. I'm all right with that. Yeah. But if I that. that forgiveness that photography offers is is totally 
more enjoyable than the lack thereof in video. Yeah. We we talked a bit about how like mud is your on your you know current ongoing uh, ongoing work, um, but I'm curious about if there is anything else that you've been working on lately, even outside of shooting photos. Yeah, well, on the topic of video, I've been trying to focus a little more like in the documentary realm um, this year, and so I have a few projects that are kind of slowly going on for that. Yeah, um, nothing that's going to be di- done anytime soon, but. Um, there's some work that I do with CSU where I'm like working on a project, a documentary project um, about a student student that is in the rodeo team and like yeah. competes in rodeos and stuff like that. So just trying to work on a few projects at once and let them breathe and see what comes out of them. But yeah, we'll see. Oh man, I, I wish I had, uh, we almost had a chance to go to a rodeo in uh, Arizona. My brother's been to one and it's apparently like an incredible time. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, yeah, crazy. It's a hoot and a holler for sure. Regarding uh, anything else that's coming up, and do you have any anything coming up that you'd want to share regarding like any exhibitions, features, publications you're in, or anything like that? Honestly, I'm kind of just laying low for a bit. I've got like oh, a yeah. few things cooking, but a lot, nothing, nothing in the near future. Honestly, just kind of yeah. like keeping my head down and working on some projects and hoping those come to fruition in the next couple of years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, though that's a uh, always an important thing to do. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, and we're and honestly, a lot of people I've talked to are kind of in that exact same space, which is a really comforting thing to hear. It is, yeah. I mean, you know, I I always get insecure about it because you know we live in the the Instagram world where everybody's posting their accomplishments, and there's huge yeah. accomplishments. Like so many of my friends are doing such great things, but you know, when you follow like thousands of people you see it every day and you get this impression that everybody's putting out great work, you know, every other yeah. week. And it's like, that's just not the case. It's, you got to give yourself time to, to rest and keep your head down. Yeah. And whatever the, uh, Instagram algorithm is choosing to show you of the 1000 people you're following, you're only going to see 20 of them. And it's the 20 people that have 20 exhibitions going on at the same time. And it's like, Oh, cool. Exactly. Thanks Instagram. Yeah. So, but anyway, that's just that's a whole separate conversation. Um, but yeah, to kind of bring things to a close here, uh, where can people find your work online? Um, got a website, benwardphoto.com, and then Instagram. I I don't use it much these days. I'm I haven't been posting a ton, but I try to get back in there every once in a while, make the algorithm happy. So <laughs> yeah, ben.p.ward at Instagram, and that's that's yep. about it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. i um, excited to see where things go from here with your work. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. I appreciate it. All right, everybody who's listening, thank you for listening. And I will see you in the next one. <laughs>